finish off the last class and then start a new segment. Um, and um, <clears throat> because of this thing of oneness, this can really, just this little bit here can wrap up a whole lot that we've discussed, but uh, so I'm just gonna make a couple of statements. Priestly food is Christ. The bread and the offerings is Christ. So priestly food is Christ. Priestly ministry is Christ. To offer the lamb constantly. To have him offered through you. Uh, bearing about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We have access into the holy place as one with Christ. Our bodies are presented as vessels, which is our reasonable priestly service. So you see that a huge portion of what people would call ministry or being a priest or being a minister relates to giving God the Son and relates to to Christ and understanding him not just doing things for God. Um, in Jeremiah 15, 19 and 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, we separate the precious, that is what is Christ, from the vile, what is us, spotted and blemished. Because the priest's job, well, let me read, the priest's job was to check what people were offering. That was their job. It wasn't just to shape the people up. It was to check what are you offering to God and make sure it was, was the unblemished lamb himself and not the best that they had. Because, frankly, a lot of people are not given the Father Christ. They're given their best. They're given their good things. But I don't care how good it is, A priest that is truly consecrated will check, will check what you're giving, and will find spots and blemishes if it's not Christ and say, quit giving this. Because in the old covenant, look how bad it would be if you tried to give something other than the spotless lamb. It'd be real bad. That was a shadow. That was a shadow. So as a priest, how did I word that? As a priest... Uh, the priest's job was to check what people were offering and make sure it was the unblemished lamb himself and not the best we had. You're not just looking for sin. You are looking for what is Christ and therefore what is not Christ. Because the only unblemished, unspotted one was the lamb. It was Jesus himself. It wasn't, it wasn't going out there and picking out good things about something well this is the this is the best I got well the best you got ain't gonna be enough it has to be Christ so this throws a lot of people because they're always looking for sin they're saying you know but whether you find sin or not you're not really supposed to be looking for sin you're looking for Christ you're supposed to be separating the precious from the vile and so, um, so that'll just sum that up. All right. This uh, last class today, I just want to talk about the eighth day. If you will, turn with me to Leviticus uh, 9. And I don't think I marked that scripture, so I hope I can find it real quick. Well, maybe someone will run across it, but it's in uh, Leviticus chapter 9 and basically. Pardon? Does it? Okay. And it came to pass on the eighth day, that's it, that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel and said unto them, uh, let's see. So, okay, yeah. This is the finishing up, though, of the, well, let's see. Let's go back to uh, Leviticus 8.33. And you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days. You get it? 
You shall not go. This is, this is at the end now. They've gone through the washing. They've gone through the anointing. They've gone through the, the clothing, being clothed with Christ. They've gone through the sacrifices. They've gone through all of this. And now the Lord is saying, now you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your con consecration are at an end. For seven days shall he consecrate you, as he hath done this day, so the Lord hath commanded to do to make this an atonement for you. Therefore shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord that you die not, for so I am commanded. And so there was, uh, they were not fully consecrated until the eighth day. This is highly important for a priest to understand. Interestingly enough, here it says you can, uh, you can stand at the door of the thing, of the, the tabernacle of the congregation. Um, um, you know, you're, in one sense, you're recognized as priests to one another, but you cannot go out of here or do anything in terms of priesthood for other people until the eighth day. All right. So I've got quite a bit here to read, and I know we don't have much time. So uh, in, in Leviticus 9, we have the eighth day of consecration for the priest. The eighth day is used sparingly, but very carefully throughout the scriptures. There was only the Feast of Tabernacles that had an eighth day thing, and if you like marking down scriptures, I'll give you several different eighth day things. Leviticus 23, 36, and 39 is the Feast of Tabernacles in the eighth day event. Uh, also in that is Numbers 29, 35. And then, uh, so, that, so the Feast of Tabernacles had an eighth day event. Also circumcision was done on the eighth day, Leviticus 12, 3. Clearly, the cross did not accomplish circumcision in a spiritual way that had no practical impact on our lives beyond just believing it's in spiritual benefits. Philippians 3.3 3 gives us insight as circumcision's practical effect, and it says, who have no confidence in the flesh. This is the place you have to come to before you're going to accept spiritual circumcision. You have to come to the place where there's no confidence in the flesh, and that's where it's cut off, and then the eighth day, that's the beginning of the eighth day. <clears throat> uh, also in uh, Exodus 22:30, with Leviticus 22:27, the firstling of an oxen and sheep were given to God on the eighth day, If you're wondering the significance of that, those are the things that were being sacrificed. Also, the leper, when cleansed, had an eighth-day service, which was very similar to the eighth day of the consecration of the, police, uh, the priest, which is blood and oil placed on the ear and the thumb and the toe. Um, and that's uh, Leviticus 14, 10 through 20 and including verses 23 through 31. So it's as if they went from being a leper to being a priest, because this is the same exact thing that took place. The cleansing of a leper and the consecrating of a priest. Basically the same service. And God's taken you from literally being a leper to a priest, just like the prodigal son. He took him instantaneously from the sin offering to the sweet savor offerings all the way through to the peace offering and sat him down and they ate together of the offering together. In one thing, in one offering, he has perfected forever them that come to God. And he takes you from zero to 60 in 2.3 seconds. That's fast. All right, so um, the last day ceremony 
the, the last eighth day ceremony we'll mention was that of a Nazarite, and that's in Numbers 6.10. A Nazarite, a priest, and a leper had similar ceremonies on the eighth day. That is because in resurrection, we're all one in Christ, and Christ is all in all. He doesn't see a leper. He doesn't see a Nazarite. He doesn't see a priest. He sees Christ in all, or he doesn't see anything. Okay. So that's why, in his mind, there's no difference in these ceremonies. He's bringing forth his son, you know. And whether he's taking him from a leper to a son, or a priest to a son, or a Nazarite to a son, doesn't matter as long as he's getting the son out of this. <clears throat> All right. So for the priest, the eighth day was the final day of the process of becoming consecrated and accepted as priests. And I'm sure they were excited the night of the seventh day that the next day they would enter into priesthood and be God's special chosen ones to carry all of this out. Just as in creation, the eighth day would never come if all that went and had ended in rest, for, unless it had all ended in rest forever. In other words, well, I've got it written here, so. If all is settled in the first seven days, why then have an eighth day? But the first creation failed, so God began a new creation. Six days God worked, and then he rested. If it's all done in seven days, why have an eighth day? Because the seven represents the end of the first creation, and the eighth day represents a new beginning, new creation. What God did tangibly, practically, in six days and then resting on the seventh, he did spiritually in one day, one day, the day of the cross, he made the new creation and brought it all forth. Six days of all this, then he rests, new creation, bam, one day, eighth day, behold, all things are new and all things are of God. So, um, the days of consecration were eight days. You go through seven days and come out as a consecrated priest on the eighth. The old creation was created in six days and God rested from that creation. The priest must pass through this creation until they are dead to it. You've got to pass through the first creation and then come out on the other end, and I'm sure I wrote that here, dead to it. Until they are dead to it and break out on the other side with the old mentality no longer an influence, but all is seen in light of the new. That's the eighth day. The old has passed away and now all things are in Christ. Seven is the completion and end of the first. And so you picture the priests, they're taken in, they're gathered into the tabernacle, they're gathered into the, fee, the, the offerings, God's doing offerings, God's putting things in their hands, they're handling him, they're touching him, they're seeing him, and that's, you know, our eyes have seen, our hands have handled of him that is the word of life. And they're sequestered, they're separated unto this, and they're fed the living reality. They're beholding nothing but God's reality. They're washing out the old way of view and everything. They're no longer influenced by the old creation. They're no longer still operating by principles of the old. They're no longer pulled by the earth principles of the old creation, gravity pulling them ever down and never letting them be in oneness with the Lord. They have broken with that first creation and they've come out on the other side of new creation. Minds washed, minds renewed, free from all of the carnal influences. You know, what did, it, what did the writer of Hebrews say? No, 
no longer after the order of carnal commandments, but after the order of an endless life. No longer trying to figure out how this works and put this together and make this fit and do all this and come up with it. And, and, you know, I have a... Did you restart this? Because I turned it off. All right. I have a... I have a theory. This is my theory. Don't believe it. I believe that... I believe that God is so much bigger than we are that if we think we got this thing figured out, we're either awfully full of pride or just stupid. I know that sounds like JW. <laughs> but it's not. That I mean I mean it has to be. Folks, you say, well, but you know, God wants us to know the whole plan. Yeah, but you know what? We don't know it. We don't know what, and especially, not so much in the spiritual realms of, the, of what the word is expressing in Christ and all that, more in terms of we can't figure it out in the earth what's going on and how it fits in. That's the deal. We got, oh yeah, we got to have control, so we got a plan all figured out, and we got it all wrapped up and sewed up, and anybody that's not, you know, of course everybody has that, I mean, or is at least seeking it. But when we get into situations and stuff, and we'll never know this until, uh, as it were, I'll just say at that day, we'll never know this, how many times we violate Jesus, how many ways we've, in order to fit things into our plan, just run over the top of the Lamb of God. We'll never know. We'll never know. And, and, and let me say, since I told you not to believe this, this is my theory. Just apply it to me then. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm willing to sit down with the Father and say, I don't know. I don't have it all figured out. I need you every given moment. I'm not the greatest man. In fact, I'm, you know, I thought that was funny that, you know, I was thinking about that today, that here the Apostle Paul, who is preaching to everyone who we are in Christ and that we're one with Jesus and that we're saints now and that we're accepted in the Beloved and all of the truth of the fulfillment of all of the offerings and everything. And now if we're found, I wrote a blues song sometime back, says if we're found at all, we're found in him. If we're going to be found, we're only going to be found in him. So there's all that gloriousness of, of oneness with Christ, and yet Paul described himself as less than the least of all. Where does that come from? How does that work into we're raised up and made to sit together far above all principalities and powers and might and dominions and you know, how, you know where I think it works in? I think that Jesus w washed us and cleansed us and made his, his bride. And we were taken out of our lowly estate and brought into, like in the Song of Solomon, into his chambers, into this, into this wonderful realm And that this thought of being less than the least of all is not based on what he did for us and what he brought, into, brought us into. It's based on the way that his spirit is where he will not lift himself up. That he's the one who takes the lowest seat. That he's the one that turns the other cheek. I wonder how many cheeks we've slapped that were Jesus's. You know. I mean, I just wonder. I, I believe it's way more than we could ever realize because we don't, we, we have it all figured out in a theology. We don't know it down here. And so we're always crossing stuff and doing stuff. Anybody ever heard of the grace of God? May we pray for it and believe for it? Amen. So I believe that for Paul to say, 
I'm less than the least of all is not some sort of a uh, rejection of the glory of being one with Christ, nor is it some sort of faithless view. I believe it's just the sweetness of Jesus being formed in him. <laughs> you know? I mean, I just, that, now, that's my opinion, okay? So we don't go by my opinion, but since I'm standing behind a pulpit, I got to express it. And uh, I suggest you not believe it. And if the Lord shows it to you, good. good. But I have no desire to push anything. In fact, I have only one desire really, really working in me, that I may know him, that I may be made conformable unto his death, that I may fellowship in his sufferings, that I may know the power of his resurrection. And if I know that, that's enough. That's not figuring everything out. That's just being with him. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, the old has passed away, and now all things are in Christ. Because the old has passed away. And now all things are in union with Christ, or they're not at all. In other words, you're, as a mind of the priest, your mind has been washed. And it has been washed and prepared and offered and everything for seven days, or the full length of whatever it takes to get free from the old creation. And you have stepped into the reality of God. And the reality of God is found in Christ. Anything that is not in union with Christ is what has been rejected. But you are in union with Christ, by the way. You have been raised up and made to sit together, not with Christ, but in heavenly places in Christ, in union with Christ. That is true. But whatever is not there, whatever is not found in oneness with him, whatever has not embraced that, what, no, whatever has not embraced God's reality of what death and resurrection brought about needs to simply come to God's view of what the cross was. It was an action taken that was including us to put us to death. What is the resurrection? It was an action taken that would include us so that we would now not be raised, you know, a million little bodies raised with him. One body, one new man, and that we would be that body, and that he would be the life, and his nature would be the expression through that body, or it's just us doing our thing for God, which, you know, I mean, the New Testament is full of examples of, of people, you know. I mean, Paul did it. He was Saul of Tarsus, but he did it, you know. And uh, it wasn't Christ when Saul, of, you know, when Saul of Tarsus did. It wasn't Christ. Did he believe in the true God? Yes. The God of Israel was the true God. Did he believe God-given things to believe? Yes. But it was all changed now in the resurrection. Everything has changed now. And now it's either him as the fulfillment or it's just a shadow. It's just a shadow. A shadow of him that has no life in it. It's just, you know. Did Paul mean well? Yes, of course he did. Have I meant well? Yes. Good for me. Just pat me on the back because I've had good intentions. If it's not Christ, if it's not Christ, then I need, to, I need to go back into the chambers, into the tabernacle, and get through the seven-day thing until I come out on the eighth day. So you pray for me. All right. Um, 
I, I just keep reading this one statement. Come out on the other side with the old mentality no longer an influence. The old mentality no longer an influence. Seeing things in light of Christ. Seeing things in light of the fulfillment. You know, I've said this before, but the book of Hebrews, somebody said to me, the book of Hebrews is a contrast between Judaism and Christianity. No, it's not. It's a contrast between everything that was religious and believed in God before of, of yes, Judaism, and Christ. You had a temple, Christ is the fulfillment. You had priests, Christ is the fulfillment. You had offerings, Christ is the fulfillment. The whole book is about either it's Christ or it's just us going through the stuff we're going through for God. No priest involved with the consecration ceremony could minister in any fashion until the eighth day. Isn't that interesting? It's like Moses said, you're not coming out of the tabernacle <laughs> until you come out on the eighth day. Not, not 24 hour days now. That was the shadow, yes. The fulfillment of that is until the day dawn and the day star rise in our hearts. That's the fulfillment. That's the real deal. And so, you know, so what am, what am I saying here? What am I calling for? All I'm saying is, with all your heart, seek the Lord. That's all I'm saying. You know, with all your heart, seek the Lord to know the Lord. Nobody can fully guide you into the revelation of Christ. They can point you in that direction, but nobody can bring you into that, only the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit. So, for that reason, God says, you cannot come out of here until you're washed of all of that stuff, until it's, you're not influenced by it anymore. How can you even divide the precious from the vile. You'll go by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Bad fruit, good fruit. Bad fruit, good fruit. It's all the same tree and it's all rejected of God. You can pull all the good fruit off you once. Oh, look, I got good fruit. You know, and he says, don't eat of that tree. Life, the tree of life, my life, my son's life. I always intended that it be my son's life. That's all that's in his heart. That was from the very beginning before there was sin. There were two trees. That was what was in his heart, was his son in this manner. So all I'm saying is what the priest did was they got in there and they soaked in an environment, an environment that was unlike what they had in their their day-to-day -day life before that moment. They were faced with offerings in ways that others had never done. They were told to cut this thing up and examine the parts. Look at the inside. They were given explicit and intimate realities in relationship to this. And to soak it, look at it, look at the head being there first. Now look at the parts being joined to the head. The head goes to the altar first and we go in union with him. But you go into that death, too. This was unheard of on, on so many fronts. So only on the eighth day did what a priest eat come forth as ministry to others, meaning they sat in there and they ate it. He said, okay, eat this now. Eat this. Ex examine the parts that deal with poison and refuse. Eat these parts. Eat the shoulder and the heart and the breast. Eat those things. Get them on the inside of you. Well, good. They can sit in there and eat all you want. But until that has assimilated, been assimilated into our being and it's Christ-life coming forth, then it's just us trying to be Christ-like. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not advocating being more loving or being more you know witnessing or anything else 
I advocate Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what I, that's what I want, and I, I want that because I believe that's what God wants. So, you know, they, they're sitting in there and eating this, but they're not really ready to come out and come to ministry until what they have eaten is coming forth through them as the life that is within them. I was thinking about the fact that they had to boil the flesh. You remember that? I was thinking, that's funny because that thing's already dead. They've already killed the, they've already, you know what I mean? They take the thing and they kill it. Okay, he's dead. They cut him up. He's for sure dead. So why are we boiling something dead? Well, I'll tell you exactly why. We're, we're applying water to the sacrifice. Again, remember you washed it early on? Now you're applying water to the sacrifice in a, where you're turning up the temperature of the water and you're boiling it until it comes to a place where we can eat it, where it can come on the inside of us, where we can assimilate it. The pressure and the heat is being put on it until that living sacrifice that he is apart from us, that word can bring it to such a place that now we're eating that thing. That's all the boiling was. It wasn't part of the, the sacrifice because that was already done. He was already, he'd already died. You, you understand what I mean when I say not part of the sacrifice. I mean not part of the dying process or whatever. He already died. It's dead. It's being boiled for one reason. So that what gave itself can be soft enough made pliable enough to be able to go on the inside of us you know anybody ever you know seen a dead animal at the grocery locker or seen a dead deer somewhere and, and thought about going over and biting into it it's hard biting man it's tough yeah. you know that, you know that you got to get in the word and let the temperature come higher than the original washing there's pressure and temperature put on it until, until there's this boiling process that brings it to a place where now I can this is beyond just believing in it and poking at it and saying I believe in that dead thing right there <laughs> you know, understand what I'm saying I believe in the offering or the sacrifice you know no this is saying oh God turn up the heat of the word of God in my life until it's until I can get it in me. I want it in me. I want more than just to believe and point at it. Well, that's the whole, that's the whole point of these priests and this eighth day thing. It's, it's brought, it's, everything is being brought to this. You're going to come out of here on the eighth day, the day of when all is fulfilled in one day. Death, burial, and resurrection, as it were, is fulfilled, and the new creation has come and it's a new beginning having a new mind having a new view you know we say having a new mind and that doesn't mean a lot new view new views of new ways of viewing things that include Christ and then that are the a reality that brings forth life and his life not just New views of, oh, you know, I used to think of that doctrine this way, but now I think of it that way. And that's fine, good. I'm glad. I'm glad God changes our mind and changes our doctrine. But, folks, he needs to change our view because we're messed up. We keep, we keep, we keep mixing seed. And God says, you know, that's not good. Not to, you shouldn't do that. <clears throat> so... Okay, only on the eighth day did what a priest eat come forth as ministry to others because he couldn't minister before that time. It is not the act of ordaining. This is real important right here. It is not the act of ordaining, but resurrection with Christ that gives the right to minister. In other words, maybe in the Old Testament shadow, you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I'm going to ordain you. Today's the eighth day. 
Here's your certificate. But that's just a shadow of what God was trying to bring about. He's trying to put away the old creation and have a whole new creation start. And folks, that doesn't come by waiting seven days until the next morning. <laughs> or seven years. It could, it could happen in seven days or seven years or seven weeks or 70 years. But the point is, till the old is finished, run its course, and ended. And the new has begun. And the new, folks, does not begin with a certificate. It begins with coming forth with Christ in his resurrection. He is the resurrection. And that's what gives the right to minister, the true, true right to minister. Because then it's not all mixed with us and our thoughts and our ideas and everything else and, you know, our preferences, you know. Well, I like this scripture and this scripture and this scripture because it fits my personality. No. 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 We don't pick and choose for what's appealing to us and then emphasize that. We see Jesus we see that we're dead with him. And they, then we see he is the life and the only life that came forth and that we're the body of that life. And we rejoice. And, we have, and now we're ready to minister. And now we're ready to pour out. So, let's see. They could, they could be priests for themselves on the seventh day, but not for others until the eighth day. And as I said, but ministry is not the result of, of, yeah, ministry is not the result of resurrection day, but of the resurrection life, which is Christ. See, because we'll, we'll say, okay, it's not seven days and then on the eighth day I'm ordained. It's seven days and then on the eighth day it's resurrection day. It's not a resurrection day. It's when the life who is the resurrection comes forth in us that the ordination has come. God looks at you and says, there is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he sees the son. You just, what a priest you are then because you're offering up what it is that God always wanted except for not in shadow form. In this way, your ministry is by Christ as the minister. This is not just a calling, but a coming forth. A coming forth of Christ. That is what marks the proper day. Because again, not a time period set in time, not time and space, not how many classes or how much how many church sermons you've heard or whatever. It is when the day dawn and the day star arises in your heart. When the, when the light shines. When the sun comes up and there's no question about darkness anymore. You know. The sun starts rising and blazing through and burning off all of the shadows. And you go, you don't grasp shadows. You don't hold on to shadows. You don't pet shadows, you don't, make, you don't pick pet shadows, my God, he is the light, he is the life, he is our peace, he is the vine, he is the way, he is the resurrection, he is my righteousness, he is, on and on and on, I mean it, the light just gets, the, the sun rises higher and higher in your heart until he's overhead, the, the, what is it? the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It, rise, it, it gets brighter and brighter until the noonday. What does that mean? It means when the sun gets fully in the center and shines down, that's when it's hard to make shadows. You're coming up over here, you can still have shadows angling over here, but the higher it goes, the shadows move in until it's... You know? The, the path of the righteous, the, those who are truly in right standing, not the best of the breed, that have found this reality is like 
the light of dawn, the light of day, it gets brighter and brighter until the noonday. And then you look around and go, well, it's, it's just Jesus. <laughs> I mean, we're his body, we're his vessel, but he's the life. He's the spirit. He's the nature of this thing. His is the timing of this. It's all about him. It's all now fulfilled and consummated in Christ being all and in all or he ain't at all. You know. It's not Christ has come to help me. I, you know, Christ has come to join forces with me. It's Christ has come to take over everything and you're all, all have not only sinned, but you all come short. See, we go, well, I ain't sinning lately. Well, you still come short of the glory of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You still, still coming short of that by trying to copy him, by trying to do the best you can. And, you know, God love you for, for all of your, your sincere sincerity. But God is not influenced by sincerity. He's influenced by the Son. All right, let me finish this up real quick. We're almost done. In this way, your ministry is, is by Christ as the minister. This is not just a calling, but a coming forth. This is what marks the proper day. It is not a time period, but true ministry waits till his resurrection and our oneness with him is clear and is obvious. That way you don't take any, anything to yourself. You don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. You think highly of Jesus. He is high and lifted up. He is far above everything else. He is the most high. He is the length and the breadth and the height and the depth and the fullness. He is Alpha and Omega. And you don't mix you in there. You don't get all in there and you don't you know, try to work, 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 you know, work your way into that. You're glad to let Christ be all and in all. Let's stand together and we'll close and we'll be out of here. Father, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit who alone will be able to break the bread of life to us, who alone will be able to truly touch our hearts and make us desire Jesus more than we desire anything else. Not just desire him for everybody else, but for ourselves, that it be more of Christ in us, that it be an increase of Christ in our lives. And that that be preeminent to us, that be number one to us, more of Jesus, less of me. More of Jesus, less of me. Father, open our hearts and open our spirits and may, there be a, may we be drawn to you and may we run and may you be the most glorious, most wonderful thing, the thing that we declare and the thing that we live because it is what pleases you. We believe that your Holy Spirit is here doing that even now. For if we believe not concerning ourselves, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. As long as we believe we're one with him, regardless of our present progress, we are held and kept until the full dawning of the sun takes place. Give us grace, Lord. Give us a hunger. Give us a desire for Jesus more and more and more. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I do have a meeting.